you're listening to Just a Pinch Podcast with Injector Kristen. Join me and industry experts as we discuss the good, the bad, and the ugly of the aesthetics, wellness, and fitness industries. Welcome back to Just a Pinch Podcast with Injector Kristen. Today is going to be a solo episode about under eyes my way, all about eye treatments. This one will be a bit controversial. I'm sure I will have plenty of other providers in my inbox telling me how I'm wrong and that I just don't know what I'm talking about and that I'm being too conservative and too nervous or scared and I'm going to tell you right now, I don't care. I appreciate your opinion and every provider has the right and respect to practice medicine in their own way as long as it is safe. And if you are uncomfortable performing a certain type of procedure, the amazing thing is you don't have to do it. Uh, You get to choose how you want to treat people and what you feel is most appropriate. So save your comments, save your feedback for how I personally like to practice because I'm not changing it based on somebody else's opinion. Until I see enough evidence to make me feel otherwise, this is how I do it. And my patients are happy and that is genuinely all that matters to me. My patients are happy and they are so much safer. So off my soapbox, all about eyes. Our eyes tell so much about us. They convey emotion, mood, expression, but sometimes our eyes don't match what we're trying to show. And at that point, that's when we start to complain about them. And at some point, we've all looked in the mirror and seen dark circles or puffiness after a long night out or after an all-night study session before a big exam. But for some people, those symptoms don't leave. And common complaints that I hear from my patients regarding their eyes include hollows under the eyes, puffy under eyes, thin, crinkly, wrinkled skin, heavy upper eyelids, low set brows, dark circles or pigmentation under the eyes. Oftentimes the complaints that the patient will say that they're struggling with is is wearing makeup uh, because it's sitting in the creases of their eyes or they feel like they literally can't leave the house without under eye concealer to hide their dark circles. Some people will make comments and ask them why if they're if they're sick or why they look so tired. Ask them, hey, are you okay today? There is nothing worse than feeling completely fine, being healthy, being well rested, and somebody asking you if you're sick. <laughs> Like, can we all agree to stop asking people if they're extra tired or sick? Like, enough. (laughs) So when I ask patients what their goals are with their their eyes, most commonly I hear, I just want to look refreshed or I want to look more awake or I don't want people to make comments about my eyes anymore. And one trend that I'm noticing that I feel like needs to be addressed when it comes to eyes are social media filters commonly on Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok, these filters are making so many girls and women and men really insecure about their skin. And I know they're not being created to do that. They're being created to almost kind of have fun with and almost make you feel better. But then when you see yourself without a filter, you feel ugly, you feel aged, you don't feel like you look as good. And that's because these filters are oftentimes smoothing out their skin so that there's not a single pore seen, not a single, you know, speck of discoloration or darkness, not a wrinkle to be seen, not a single expression line. And it looks like you're a cartoon. It looks like somebody drew you in and your skin is just so perfect and porcelain that you look like you're sculpted out of stone with zero movement and no hollows. And this is 100% unrealistic. And it's making so many people feel insecure about how their eyes and their face in general look. But eyes are where I'm hearing a lot about it. Number one is you have to realize that these filters are fake. They're not real life. We cannot make you walk around with porcelain looking under eyes and not a single hollow and not a single wrinkle or imperfection in your under eyes. We can't do that. Medical aesthetics cannot do that. We can make improvements, we can absolutely help with your concerns, but we have to make sure that those concerns are real because these filters are creating a wild, 
wild level of body dysmorphia in many of us. If you've used a filter and put it on and thought you looked so much better and then took it off, how many of you have then looked at yourself and been like, ugh? Like, we all do that. And that's dysmorphia. These things are making us feel worse about ourselves, not better. So, I mean, I'd love to say stop using filters, but that's not realistic and everybody's going to continue to. So you need to really keep yourself in check and realize that these are fake. This is not real life and that we cannot make you look photoshopped. We can make things look better. We can improve the look of things. We can make other things less noticeable. But you cannot come in with unrealistic expectations of expecting your under eye area to look perfect. It's not going to happen. And if you genuinely want them to look perfect, I'm not going to treat you because you're going to be unhappy and then you're going to be upset with me. And unfortunately, this isn't a me problem. This is now a you problem. If you want your under eyes to look like a filter, there's a real easy, easy, easy thing that you can do for that. Use the filter. Use the filter. You want to post all your pictures filtered so that you look flawless in every single one of them? Go right ahead. Go right ahead. You know what? And it's free. It's not going to cost you a, a penny compared to what you're going to be paying to come in and try to have these things done to you. So if your expectation is to look like a filter, use the filter. But we can't make you look like that in real life. Our eyes are constantly fluctuating and changing and oftentimes even throughout the day. The skin around our eyes is the thinnest skin on our body, and thus it's very unforgiving. You probably feel the most puffy first thing in the morning, and this can sometimes occur because of salt intake the day before, or from sleeping laying down too flat, and just general fluid and lymphatics that are properly draining. So if you're one of these people, I definitely recommend sleep a little bit more upright with an extra pillow under your head at night. And make sure that you're also sleeping on your back and not your side. That's going to give you the, the best lymphatic drainage from your eyes and help with that morning time puffiness. Because this skin is also so thin, it's going to be prone to appearing dark in color. And this oftentimes comes from the reflection of blood vessels that are underneath the skin. And some people will actually develop actual pigment in the skin or melanin uh, around their eyes, which can make them appear darker as well. Also, if you're prone to seasonal allergies, you've probably been getting what we call allergy shiners under your eyes. I know that when I'm personally going through ragweed season, I wake up in the morning and I literally look like I have two black eyes, like I got punched in the face. <laughs> and, you know, if, if that's you coming into your local med spa for a treatment, unfortunately, isn't going to fix the problem. Um, you know, you need to deal with the allergies. So don't come running in, you know, looking for us to fix something if you know, you know that you're in the midst of your allergy season and your eyes just look like shit. I mean, it is what it is. It happens to many of us. Uh, what you need to do is control it with antihistamines like Zyrtec. Um, I also adore things like fluticasone or Flonase nasal spray. Um, the nasal sprays actually help out with the eyes quite a bit. So that one gives me a lot of results. Um, but even with my allergies properly treated, sometimes it just flares up and you're going to look like you got punched in the face. So it is what it is. Hollows under the eyes are very multifactorial, but the main determinant in your level of hollowness is your genetics. I'm sure you've seen infants, children of all ages, and then just general people of all ages with under eye hollowing and darkness. And this is just a normal variant of being human and of human facial anatomy. So don't think because you have some hollows under your eyes or dark circles under your eyes that you're abnormal. I mean, I'm sure there are many more of us on this planet with hollows and darkness under our eyes than those that are, you know, pristine and look like they had work done when they didn't. Size of your bony eye socket, the amount and positioning of your periorbital fat pads, the anatomy of your facial ligaments, the quality of your skin, those all play a role in the appearance of your under eyes as well. So it's not just one thing. And that's why that our genetics play such a role in how our eyes look. Our bony eye socket is actually one of the first parts of our facial anatomy to change with aging, and they widen. And when they widen, there's less structural support underneath the eyes, and they can appear more sunken and hollow and dark in general. Now, there is a wide variety of eye treatments available in the non-invasive, minimally invasive, and surgical arenas when it comes to our eyes. But the first step in caring for your delicate under eye and periorbital skin is using a high quality eye cream. My personal favorite is, as you guessed it, 
elastin restorative eye complex. This cream won't be giving you that instant tightened look, but what it does do is give you long-term benefits by increasing your collagen and elastin production, fighting melanin production, thickening the skin, reducing fine lines and wrinkles, reducing crow's feet, and brightening the skin, so helping with that dark color. Other alternatives that I like are Zeo Skin Health's Growth Factor Eye Serum. Um, this one is also really good um, to help prolong the effects of like your, your neuromodulator injections in the crow's feet area. Uh, I also love their Intensive Eye Cream. SkinCeuticals also makes a couple that I really like. Um, SkinCeuticals makes one um, that I love for puffiness. So if you are puffy, you want to look for a product that contains caffeine. And this works beautifully to help hide and depuff the eyes with a little bit more of an immediate type of result. Um, if you do have puffiness, you can also just use a sm small ice roller, uh, a jade roller under the skin in the morning just to help depuff and help promote good lymphatic drainage. Uh, if expression lines are a problem for you, like crow's feet, or you know you get some under eye lines, getting neuromodulator injections is a great way to reduce those and by reducing your muscle movement. So if you're trying to open the eyes more, uh, you need to treat the glabellar complex, so your scowl lines, and then all around the eyes with that eye muscle, that orbicularis oculi muscle. Uh, that's going to help lift things and kind of give you that more wide awake, open look. Now. Don't neglect your frontalis muscle. Um, you know, we talked about this a couple episodes ago when we were talking about tox, but depending on your personal anatomy, you also might need a little bit up there too. So you can also use microtox, which we talked about in episode two, under the eyes. Um, if your anatomy allows and there's not too much skin laxity, this can help smooth out those fine lines and give just an overall kind of more glassy type appearance. And it is temporary, so that's not a long-term result. That'll be kicking around for about two to three months or so. Uh, I have some patients that swear by this treatment, and we do it every single time that we're doing all their neuromodulator injections. If the skin of the eye is more lax and crinkly, that's when I like to start using collagen stimulating procedures. Some of my favorite include Vivace or really any of the RF microneedling systems. I like laser treatments. You can either do ablative or non-ablative treatments for ablative. I love, love, love the Cool Peel CO2 laser. Um, if you have more aged skin and you need a little bit more help than what a cool peel can help with, using a, a DECA setting in CO2 is also really good. But honestly, I've seen such impressive results in the under eye skin quality of, of all ages using the, the cool peel that, I mean, that's my go-to. Oftentimes when I'm doing a DECA treatment on a full face, I'll switch it over to cool peel around the eyes anyways, just because it's so nice. So for the non-ablative lasers, you can do things like Fraxel or Halo. I mean, there's a slew of them out there, but personally, the CO2 is one of my favorites. Um, and I really like that one because I can get up super close to the eyes um, without using like a big clunky handpiece. But that's not so much for you to worry about. That's for me to worry about. So when doing these energy devices, I always recommend starting with a series of three sessions. You're going to want to come in about once every month to month and a half for a total of three sessions to start and then move into maintenance about one every six to 12 months. Now, if you are a more severe case and your skin is a little bit more treatment resistant, you may require more, but three is always my bare minimum. Oftentimes, there's really minimal to no downtime associated with these treatments. Uh, the Vivace probably has the least amount that you're probably going to be a little pink, maybe puffy for 12 to 24 hours. The cool peel will also have more minimal downtime um, that you're going to be pink for anywhere between one to two, maybe three at the absolute worst days, and then just feel kind of rough, dry and textured after that. And those two are some of the most comfortable ones that we can offer as well. Another treatment option for helping stimulate collagen production and also give an immediate lifting effect to the under eyes is smooth PDO threads. I love using PDO threads in the under eyes to get that collagen stimulated. And honestly, it really does give that instant result too. Now, the main downside to this treatment is that you are more likely to bruise since we're using small needles that are passing horizontally through the skin and not just giving one little downward puncture. Um, however, I have had a few patients get this done with zero bruising. I mean, pat myself on the back here, um, but they're the exception and not the rule. So it absolutely can happen. Um, now, one nice thing that there is, is there's a brand of threads called PDO Max, and they make um, these smooth threads that are 
all lodged into cannulas. So we can actually treat that under eye area with just one poke and then cannulate them in almost more like a, a lifting type thread, but they're smooth. So a lot less trauma to the area and less risk of downtime. Those will be a little bit more expensive than traditional like um, mint smooth threads just because they're loaded onto a cannula. It costs us more. It's going to cost you more, but those are also an option. Some providers are also starting to use this really awesome thread called mesh fill, and that's made by Miracu threads. And they're 20 smooth threads that are woven together, kind of like a Chinese finger trap. And they're loaded onto a cannula as well, and they're inserted through one hole into the skin. And because they just take up more general bulk, they give a much better volumization to the skin and can be a really good option not only for skin tightening, but for helping lift those, those sunken eyes and help with those hollows. The neat thing with these threads, these mesh fill ones, is that you can technically, you know, mesh fill, what's the fill part? So you can technically fill it. So you can attach that mesh fill to um, a syringe of filler or of PRF, and you can give a little tiny squirt. It doesn't hold a lot. It holds a very, very small amount, and it'll give an even longer lasting result. Um, my personal preference is to use PRF with them, and you can also use them in any other place in the face. Personally, I really like them in the nasal labial folds and like the marionette area. And speaking of threads, we can also use barbed or lifting threads to help open up the eyes and give a little bit more of a brow lift. And this won't help the under eyes per se, but it can improve the overall appearance of tie tired eyes and heavy brows in some patients that are a good candidate. And your skin has to really be mobile. It can't be too thin. Um, you know, this is really a procedure more for the younger type of client that is going to be, you know, pre-brow lift. Uh, and this procedure is painless after numbing, and you get an instant lifted result. It takes about a month to fully heal and settle, and it will be a little bit more dramatic initially. So on treatment day, we have to pull those threads just about as tight as they can go on treatment day because as you heal, they're going to drop and they're going to settle a little bit. So you're, if we send you out on treatment day looking perfect, odds are you're not going to be super happy with how you look once you're fully healed uh, because it will drop and settle a bit. You will feel sore after the numbing wears off and it just kind of feels like a too tight ponytail headache. Those threads actually move backwards from the tail and kind of center of your brow into your scalp and they anchor on some of that scalp tissue. So that area will feel sore. Um, you will potentially be bruised. You'll also be a little bit puffy. Um, we're going to do another big episode about all things threads in the future, actually a couple of them. So this part's going to be just a little bit more abbreviated. But just know that lifting threads are an option for helping open up the eyes, give a little bit more arching to the brows, lift the corner of those brows up. And in some cases, it can help the look of just heavier upper eyelids as well. It's not going to be a replacement for a blepharoplasty or a actual surgical brow lift, but it can be a nice little interim way to try it on and help stimulate some collagen and, and try a, a shorter acting result. Okay, so here comes the part of today's episode that will be very controversial and I am more than aware that I am probably in the minority versus the majority here and I'm going to explain why and you can choose to take it or leave it but you're going to understand my point of view by the end um, whether you agree with it or not and I respect everybody's opinions about this matter and I do not feel um I don't feel that providers that do perform this procedure are doing a disservice to their patients or are being dangerous. That's that's not how I feel. I mean, everybody has their own level of comfort with these procedures, and time will tell over long term how it goes. But this is, I'm not throwing shade. This is just my personal opinion and why I choose to do or not do certain things. So I am sure you've seen on social media the instant gratification of tear trough filler or under eye filler using products like Restylane, Bellatero, Versa, uh, or others. And this is an option, but in my very, very personal opinion, it is not the best choice for most patients. And I used to perform this treatment, and I had good outcomes, and my patients were overall quite happy with their results. But over time, I started to read more literature and see more case studies 
about the risks of tear trough filler and long-term side effects of using hyaluronic acid-based filler in this under eye area. So these fillers are made out of hyaluronic acid, which means that they're water loving and that they're going to swell and they're going to, they're going to shift. Some days they're going to be more swollen with water and other days they're going to be a little bit less. Um, as a little example, if you get lip filler done, you probably notice that some days, and especially in the morning, your lips feel juicier than others and other days they don't feel quite as big. And that's because it all depends on your water content. So when we're placing these HA fillers into the tear trough area, we're placing them in a notoriously wet area of the face under the skin that is the thinnest in the body. So it's a very unforgiving place. And this can lead to lumps, bumps, filler migration, swelling, delayed onset swelling, and it can actually end up being more unsightly than before fillers were placed. I have dissolved more tear trough filler placed at other offices than in my own, and this played into my choice here as well. Now, I know there's there's a, a bunch of injectors out there that are well known for their tear troughs. Uh, Shelby Miller, for example, out in Utah, does beautiful work, and that's just what we're seeing on social media, and I'm not saying that her results, you know, maybe aren't as good in person or long term. I don't know. I'm not her patient. I've never had it done. But like she's somebody that is a tear trough expert um, and she even teaches about her her technique. So if you were to get tear trough filler, you know, I wouldn't just seek out your local med spa and go to whoever's local. I'd be seeking out these experts, you know, and in some cases, if you have your heart set on getting filler done in your under eyes, not for nothing, I'd fly to Utah and have her do it for me. Um, but again, my opinion. So filler is a foreign body implant, and we can have an immune response to having this substance in our body. And it's not uncommon to hear about a patient developing a common cold, upper respiratory illness, um, and in some cases, really any illness anywhere in their body, and their filler swells. And this isn't just with tear troughs. It can be filler that's placed anywhere in the body. Um, like for a personal anecdote, I had cheek filler placed um, in was it 2017? And anytime that I got sick or if my allergies flared up or really anything, anytime that my immune system was revved, my cheek filler would get very painful. Like it would almost feel like I just had it done and it would swell. So for that reason, for my own personal body chemistry, filler might just not be for me. Um, and I'm sure there's plenty of people out there who don't get those side effects, but this is a potential side effect. And this is things that that patients need to be aware of when they're choosing to get this done and know that this is a potential thing that can happen to them. Now, when this filler is placed in the under eyes, even when it's very properly placed, it can swell and it can cause unsightly side effects. And there's not much that can be done at the time but to wait it out. Um, this can happen with allergies, crying seemingly for no reason at all. And of course, you can treat with steroids and antihistamines, cold compresses, um, or, you know, God forbid, antibiotics if you feel that there's an infectious source causing this. But there's not much you can do. And so really determining who's a good candidate for tear trough filler is of utmost importance. And most of the tear trough filler that I see on Instagram and social media are horrifically poor choices for that particular patient. I really think the tear trough filler, if it's going to be used, should be used on people in their 20s and 30s and maybe up to age 40, 45. Um, and that's just for general quality of under eye skin. And then there's plenty of people that fit that age category. They're still poor candidates. If we were to look at truly what makes somebody a ideal candidate for tear trough filler to have the least risk of complications and long term you know, I don't, I don't even want to use the term complication, but long-term side effects, we would be doing a fraction of the tear trough filler that's being done out there. If you have skin laxity, tear trough filler is not for you. If you have herniated fat pads, tear trough filler is not for you. If you are prone to allergies, sinus infections, upper respiratory infections, tear trough filler is not for you. If you have an autoimmune condition, tear trough filler is not for you. 
that's just a, a, a small list of things. So there's a lot of bad tear trough filler out there. I have people come in and they're getting their tear trough filler done elsewhere for um, darkness under their eyes and hollows and they come in and their eyes now look darker because now they have Tyndall effect and that filler is reflecting light off of or the light is reflecting off of the filler and reflexing back up and their under eyes now look blue and they look bulgy and they're actually protruding out above their skin and that protrusion and that swelling can be all the time or it can just be sometimes. You know, if <laughs> there's so many variables that go into it that I just don't understand why this is the product that we as a collective community in medical aesthetics have said, yep, this belongs here. This is the perfect product for this area because it's not. I really don't think that it is. To me, tear trough filler with hyaluronic acid-based fillers is a big fat case of just because we can doesn't mean we should. It gives that instant gratification when, you know, I'll, I, I hear it in my ears already of every who's saying, oh, if you just do small amounts, it needs to be properly placed. Know your anatomy. You know, blah, 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 blah. I still don't think it's the right product. I don't. And... That's how I feel. Tear trough filler migration is a big problem as well, even in people that have had very properly placed filler. And the migration can sometimes be downwards and it can move down and you can see a little ridge form or worst case scenario, it actually migrates behind the orbital rim and thus behind the eyeball. There have been several cases documented who had, in some cases, immediate onset swelling and in some cases delayed onset swelling even years down the road. And they went in to have follow-up done and they had what they thought was their filler dissolved, but they kept on having this swelling and they couldn't get it to go away. And it wasn't until they had MRI studies done that showed that that filler despite being placed safely and correctly, had migrated behind the eye. And then at that point, that filler needs to be dissolved by placing a needle or a cannula behind the eye to do a retrobulbar injection of Hylinex to dissolve the remaining filler that moved back there. And that is also a high-risk procedure and also something that I would not trust any run-of-the-mill um, you know, aesthetic provider to perform. That's something that most people will never have to do in their lifetime, and that should be referred out to a a retinal specialist and, and an eye doctor, somebody that is comfortable doing that because of the risk of, of that location. Um, unless your provider is well-versed in that and well-trained and has true experience doing it, do not let them do that. That's insane to me. Uh, but that's what it took to resolve that chronic swelling. So the tear trough area is one of the more high-risk areas to place filler, and that's also due to the location of the infraorbital foramen, which is in, which within that area, um, there's an important artery, vein, nerves, just a bundle of, of no-nos. <laughs> and a vascular occlusion in this area could potentially lead to irreversible blindness, stroke, or necrosis of the skin. Now, those... Um, complications of, you know, blindness, stroke, necrosis of the skin, that can occur in other areas of the face with, with fillers as well. It's not just this area, but this area is higher risk for it. So after spending time researching tear trough fillers and HA fillers, I just made the decision to stop performing it. And it wasn't because I was unhappy with my outcomes. I was actually quite happy with them. But what my concern was that I was sitting back and waiting for that complication to come. And with eyes, I genuinely believe that it is a matter of when and not if. So for me and my practice, I took HA fillers out of the equation in that particular area of the face. I still support the under eye area of, we you know, of the cheek and mid face and temples with filler. And yep, temples are high risk too. I, I inject in other high-risk areas, 
but they are other high risk areas that I know that I can mitigate my risk by performing them in certain ways and with certain tools and that I don't have to worry about poor aesthetic outcomes in those areas remotely as much as with the very, very unforgiving under eyes. So if somebody presents to me with true under eye hollowing that I previously would have reached for a filler, now what I'm reaching for is PRF. And PRF is platelet rich fibrin and that comes from your own blood. So we draw one tube of your blood we spin it down in a centrifuge to isolate your PRP first, platelet-rich plasma, and then we airlessly transfer it from that PRP tube into a tube that contains a very small amount of calcium chloride, which is going to activate your platelets, thus turning it into PRF. And after 10 minutes of being PRF, it will then transform into PRFM, or platelet-rich fibrin matrix, which is more of a gel-like consistency. And it has a greater number of growth factors and stimulation. So you are going to get a, a temporary immediate filling effect. So for the first couple of days after having PRF injected into your under eyes, they're going to look better. And it's almost like that instant gratification of a, a tear trough filler. But it does not stay that way because our, our body's uh, PRF and PRP is a lot of water. So that water is going to get absorbed in. And it's going to leave behind what I consider, you know, like little grass seeds of all those growth factors. And that's going to stimulate your body to create more collagen, elastin, better blood vessels, just strengthen all of the skin and support structures in that area. And so then over a period of about three to six months, you're going to see an improvement in the quality of the skin, reduction in dark circles, tightening of the skin, fewer lines and wrinkles, but now PRF needs to be done in a series of treatments. So one is not enough, okay? So you do need to come back every month or two to have this injection done for ideal results. Um, in most of my patients, the bare minimum that I'll do is two, and some people do require as many as four to six, but three is typically where I'm, I'm seeing probably 90% of my patients at. And we do our series of three we wait for three to six months to see those final results. You will see improvements along the way. Uh, when I bring you back in for your second treatment, your eyes are already going to look better than what they did before you came in for the first one. So it's a nice little incremental change. Um, and the great thing with PRF, we don't have to worry about lumps. We don't have to worry about bumps. We don't have to worry about migration. We have a substantially less risk of vascular occlusion. I never say never in an area because technically this is forming a thicker like gel um, and technically a clot so you absolutely could have an occlusion however it would be less dramatic less less risky and because when we're injecting it it's very liquidy when you are aspirating with it you know it's it's like aspirating water almost so it's very easy to aspirate with so it's generally a much safer product you also can't be allergic to it it's literally your own it's your own brand <laughs> you're basically creating your own personal brand of quote filler um, or in this case truly a biostimulator and when we inject PRF into your under eye area, it's done in a very similar technique to classic tear trough filler. Um, I do mostly cannula work with it. So we numb you up on the cheek. We use a blunt cannula to introduce that filler to some deep layers. And then I'll also kind of sandwich it, you know, below the muscle, on top of the muscle. And then in some cases, I will also use a tiny little needle and I will do smaller blebs of it. But typically I like to do the blebs with PRP versus PRF, um, kind of more superficially in the skin to create more tightening. maintenance for PRF is different for everybody. So typically I will recommend every six to 12 months to come in for one session, but you may get a lot longer out of it. Uh, I had my eyes treated with PRF uh, about three years ago and it genuinely lasted me uh, over three years. And it wasn't until this year that I felt like I needed a little touch up. And if you had been following along with my Instagram at all over the summertime, when I had my PDO brow lift done, I also had my PRF under eye session kind of touch up at that time too. So side effects of PRF in the under eye area, you can initially get some swelling, but more people than not um, don't get a dramatic type of swelling. You also may bruise. Um, usually it'll just be at the insertion site, but because we do have a lot of little tiny vessels in the under eye area and some of them can be pretty fragile, it is possible to bruise anywhere, um, even with a cannula. You might feel mildly tender to the touch in the areas that you've been injected or cannulated just from local inflammation. 
If you want to get even a little bit more aggressive with your under eye treatments, we can do PRF injections in combination with other procedures such as laser or Vivace on the exact same day and it works fantastic. So when we do that, we will either do your Cool Peel first or your Vivace around the eyes. Um, and I do offer a package of that. Um, personally at my office, we offer packages of Cool Peel Eye, Vivace Eye, and also Cool Peel PRF and Vivace PRF. So that's not treating the entire face. If your only concern is around your eyes, that's where we'll focus. You know, I'd, I'd love to have you treat your whole face, but that's not in the, the books for some people. So we can just treat your under eyes. So we put a you know topical numbing cream on, we do your laser, we do your Vivace. While we're doing that, we've already drawn your blood. It's spinning down in the centrifuge. And then when we're done, little tiny blub of some numbing, poke, and then in we go and you're filled. So now you're getting even more collagen and elastin stimulation. And if you're choosing to do the Vivace, you're also getting those tiny little thermal injuries under the skin for even more tightening. So if you have a lot more kind of laxity in the skin and some looser skin, I'm going to recommend doing the combo treatment as opposed to if you just have like some hollowness. So at the end of the day, we just really need to be realistic when it comes to treating the eyes. And surgery is oftentimes the most appropriate treatment for the upper and lower eyes. And even with minimally invasive techniques, um, our non-invasive techniques can only go so far. And sometimes we need to do a combination of, you know, if you have poor quality skin, doing things like PRF and lasers and microneedling can do really good things to improve the quality of your skin. But if you have fat pad herniation or you have, you know, massive hollowing that needs fat transfer, or you need an upper blepharoplasty to help reduce and, and literally cut out excess skin in your upper eyelids, you're going to get a better result by combining these techniques. Um, and surgery can oftentimes be cheaper in the long run than continuing to try to do tear trough filler after tear trough filler, dissolving tear trough filler, trying different techniques. Uh, so get the surgical consult, at least be fully informed about what your, your options are. You know, you might be paying five, six plus thousand dollars for your your eyes, but it's going to last you a long time. Um, now, it doesn't necessarily mean that surgery is one and done. Um, you know, if you are getting your eyes done in your 40s, you are going to continue to age. You're going to continue to lose collagen and elastin, and you may end up needing to have a revision surgery done, you know, 10, 20 years down the road to, to get rid of more skin that you, you've kind of accumulated there. So just remember that any type of surgery despite the fact that we like to think of it as a, as permanent. I mean, and it is permanent. You know, you can't undo surgery in that sense. Um, it's, it's not one and done oftentimes, unless you're getting it done quite literally towards more of the end of your life. Um, so it's not abnormal to need a facelift revision, another neck lift, another blepharoplasty. Um, so these things do happen. And so... You might get a better result, a longer lasting result, but depending on your age at the time, be aware that you may need to have repeat surgeries. I like to be truly honest with all of my patients about when I think surgery would be better suited for them. And it's up to them on whether they want to go ahead and get that consultation or not. If they choose that surgery is not on the table and they say, nope, I never want surgery, I'm just, I'm not going to do it and they want to try some non-invasive options despite the fact that I think that they are a substantially better surgical candidate and there's no medical contraindications to doing these treatments, we can absolutely move forward and do them. But we need to also have realistic expectations where we can't give you that surgical result with non-surgical techniques. So that's my take on eyes. How are you feeling about it? I mean, I was honestly a little bit hesitant to put it out there because I know that I am opening myself up to plenty of criticism and critique but I mean that's what we're here for and we're here to learn from each other and I've had conversations with a lot of providers lately that actually agree with me and are doing substantially more PRF injections and uh, energy devices for under eyes and are really getting kind of disenfranchised with using the HA fillers in the under eye area. And so I feel really well supported with that. And I know that there's plenty of people that are going to feel completely opposite of how I feel. And they're going to think that I'm just being super conservative and nervous and that, oh, she just doesn't know what she's doing. If you learn the right way and, you know, get the training and get properly trained that you can do it too. 
I sure. <laughs> okay. Like I said, I wasn't having bad outcomes. I wasn't. I was not that injector that was doing tear troughs and just having, you know, problem after problem after problem. I was not. I had very happy patients. I electively chose to stop performing it due to the potential complications and risks of that area. So it is quite literally just my opinion and my personal way of treating. You know, I've seen firsthand the beautiful results that my patients are getting with energy devices, topical creams, and PRF injections, and threads, and they're happy, they're healthy, they're satisfied. And what truly most of them have come back and said to me is that they really, really respect and appreciate me being a little bit more conservative of, a, of an aesthetic provider. Because I tell all of them when they come in, what the options are, why I choose to do certain types of techniques and, and methodologies, and why I don't choose to do others. So I give them full informed consent. And if they still want tear trough filler, I'll recommend that they can go to other places for that. And I'll give them recommendations of where they should go. Um, and if, if they need surgery, I'm going to give them recommendations where to go to. I'm not just going to send them loose and say, best of luck and slap them on the ass. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm still going to be there for my patients even if it's for a service that I'm not performing anymore. And you know what? I'm still going to be there for you if you ever need your filler dissolved too. And remember, I throw no shade. I'm not judging others that choose to use HA fillers in the under eyes. You know, there's fillers that are FDA approved for that area now, and it's not off label. And this is the wonderful thing about being a medical provider is that you get to choose what you're comfortable with and what you're not. I will always have a more conservative approach to injectables. Um, that's just me. That is my way of injecting. I look at less is more, balance is key, and safety over everything. I welcome your comments and your questions. Please feel free to shoot off an email or a DM. Um, I'll leave it in the info in the show notes below. Thank you so much for listening and be sure to join me next week. Episodes drop every Monday morning at midnight on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Please take a moment to subscribe, rate, review, give me a thumbs up, give me any feedback you have, positive or negative. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you for listening. Just a Pinch Podcast was written, recorded, edited, and produced by Kristen Jem. 